Sometimes you gotta jump the zombie takeout. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scott. And before we get to this week's movie, we have quite a bit of front matter. Um, yeah, this one's going to be a long one. Um, see, you know, end of the end of the year. I almost said end of the season. Um, so you know, <laughs> something to hold you over because we're taking is, a few weeks you know, off. That's kind of how we've worked, though. You know, the, yeah. the years, the season. You, you could argue that. Um, starting with a voicemail from Bodo. Bodo here. Hey, I know I've been a horrible, horrible supporter. Actually, I've been saving up those podcasts and not listening to any of them. So I have something to listen to over the holiday season. I just want to say I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Hope you have a ho- happy holiday season, whatever you may celebrate. And a happy New Year. And I hope, like hell, I don't listen to the last episode and says, we're retiring before the end of the year. Anyway... I will talk to you guys next year, and I will be my usual, wonderful, pain in the ass as usual. You guys are the best. Peace. Thank you, Bodo. Happy holidays. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving as well. Happy holidays. Um, yeah, we were going to mess with you over that, but we consulted of, while I was reading that to Scott and decided against it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank him. Um, on to some news. This is from Nerdist. Chris Pine to star in a Dungeons and Dragons movie. John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldsmith, this is just an excerpt, both directed Game Night and wrote Spider-Man Homecoming or directing and writing the script based on a Michael Gilio pen draft. The film will be an ensemble, according to the deadline, will take a, quote, subversive approach to the game. What? Don't do this. <laughs> What's the definition of insanity again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many of these have they made now? This was inevitable given the success of Critical Role and the honestly oversaturation of uh, role playing you know, TTRPG streams going on now. Yeah. I watch. I haven't played yet. I, I'm lined up to play in a game soon. A friend of mine's DMing. She invited me in. I've already rolled my character. We did like a short session, one on one session over uh, Facebook Messenger. So hopefully soon. Um,. But I watch like 20 hours of streams a week. D&D, Star Trek Adventures, um, Vampire the Masquerade, a bunch of them. So I'm fucking target demo for this movie. <laughs> I am the person they're looking for. Thing is, and you know, you played for, you know, your teens and into your 20s. Your teens and 20s extensively. Um, D&D doesn't work in a movie. Yeah, I mean, I didn't make it into my 20s. I think, I think it was... I think I cut off at like 19 or maybe I did. I can't remember now. Okay. Maybe I was drinking too much. Okay. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> but and, we've already done a Dungeons and Dragons oh yeah, movie. And, and it was we shit. reviewed it on here, right? D&D doesn't work. D&D is fun no. for two reasons. As a player, you get to, you know, live out this fantasy story and try any shit you can think of. And if you roll well enough, it works. And from a viewing standpoint, watching an actual game, it's not predictable. That's why I watch so much. That's why I love it so much. You know, mainstream fiction, commercial fiction is ridiculously predictable. True. You know, especially when you've been reviewing movies for over a decade. <laughs> they have to hit certain points. They have to hit certain tropes. The beauty of watching a role-playing game, the decisions are made by the player's in the spur of the moment with seconds to decide and frequently re- affected, you know, re- legislated by a die, by a die roll. You know, there's no way to predict it. My fa- I had no idea that, that such a thing called improv existed and I'd been doing it as a kid <laughs> exactly, for exactly. so many years. So my favorite moment in any RPG I've watched was the current campaign of Critical Role, early-ish in the in the campaign. The, they were going down to this dock to kind of intimidate someone to get some answers. I think they were working for a crime lord. Right. Um, the plan went sideways. They had to bug out. 
They stole a ship, grabbed the guy, tied him up in the in the key hall, and they were pirates for the next several months. <laughs> you can't put this shit in a script. <laughs> yeah, the, the dungeon master has to be very, you know, <laughs> responsive, you know. Yeah, they got to roll with it. Yeah. But you can't do that kind of shit in a script. Dungeons role-playing games do not work as movies. This was inevitable. It had to happen. But unless they do something incredibly creative with it, like, I mean, okay, Stranger Things is effectively D&D. Right. But it works because they took it in a different direction. They don't try to sell it as D&D. It's kids that play. Right. So it's somehow, the game somehow translates into the real, quote unquote, real world. Yeah. Of the show. Yeah. Yeah. That works, but that's really the only example. If you try to just do an adventure party movie, that's all it's going to be. And it could be very good, but it's not going to be D&D. I mean, there was one successful one. I think it was called um, Lord of the Rings. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I I mean... And even that series kind of got troublesome towards the end. Yeah, exactly. Especially for that that prequel they did. Um, when you stretch a book out into three movies. Well, it was actually originally going to be three books. The Hobbit. The, the um the the Lord of the Rings was going to be three books originally, or was it really originally three uh, books? Well, I'm talking about the Hobbit. The oh, Hobbit the Hobbit was yeah, a yeah. single book, right? And they, they stretched the, yes. it out. That was the prequel. Yeah. that they stretched out right. into three, to three movies. Yeah, that, 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 that was that wasn't good from go. Um, no, that was a bad idea. I mean, I'm going to see it because I'm damn curious what they're going to do with it, but I'm not expecting good things. We're probably going to review it on here. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> just And just, these aren't really new stories. Episode 180, by the way, is the first Dungeons & Dragons okay. movie. <laughs> and these next two things aren't news stories. I don't have actual stories or links. They're just discussion points. Um, one I found out about because um, Disney just you know announced a slate of new shows. Of like 20 Star Wars shows I'm interested in four. Um, but this is a rumor. Disney's making everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that was the... I mean... And, and by the way, the, the, there are a lot of people that are like, why'd they do this all at once? It was a stockbroker meeting. Uh-huh. Yeah. And because they had such, you know, so much shit that yeah. their stock just skyrocketed right. that next day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone was like, you're doing how many Star Wars I'm buying. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially since the Mandalorian's doing real well, and so yeah. they they just want to ride that. Um, they they the, struck while the iron is hot. They are yeah. not stupid. Exactly. And this is just a rumor, but it is rumored that they're going to be rebooting Firefly. <laughs> this is a again a bad idea. Um, I adore <laughs> Firefly. It is one of my absolute favorite shows, and. It is a nearly perfect masterpiece. There's one episode that I think is a little iffy. Heart of Gold, the one where they're guarding the the brothel. I think that one's a little iffy. The rest is genius. There's no way they can live up to the original. The beauty of Firefly, though, is it had that one season. Mm -hmm. And it never had a chance to, you know, jump the shark. (laughs) they, They did 14 episodes. They're nearly perfect. As much as I love Buffy, it kind of went to shit in season four and never really recovered. Um, as much as they tried, um, you know. Now, were they talking about doing Firefly as a as movies or as it's a, a series. TV show? It's a series because it's mm-hmm. Disney Plus. So you know, science fiction series, science fiction in quotes. Because let's be honest, Star Wars is fantasy, but. <laughs> You know, they want to make another sci-fi. The rumor is, you know, they're hot on sci-fi series now because of Marvel and Star Wars. So they're going to jump on Firefly because of the still massive, rabid fan base. Um, Firefly was lightning in a bottle. And it benefited from only having 14 episodes so it could never get bad. It started damn strong and never, you know, got weak. Um, like even the movie that they put out, I yeah. thought, you know, Serenity, I thought it was a bit iffy. I mean, it wasn't as good yeah, no. as I mean, the show. It's damn good, but it's not as good as the series. I agree. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is not. Hopefully it's just a rumor. Hopefully it doesn't happen. Now. Well, if they were to do it, who should. Uh, who? I mean, oh, I'm not even gonna, anybody. 
Yeah. No? I don't even yeah, want to like, think about anybody else playing those roles. I, I do love going through comments. I really wish I didn't like going through comments. I really wish I could <laughs> avoid comment sections. My life yeah. would be so much better. But uh, I do. Same. And, same. Uh, I One of these days I will like, learn not to read the comments. Uh, but... For these, they're they're hilarious though. Oh. Like someone was like, "Well, they better get Nathan Fillion because he's like the only person that can play." I'm like, "You really gonna get Nathan Fillion like thirty no. years later?" Because <laughs> this was my hope when I still wanted a new Firefly show. You know, we all want the original cast back. When I realized, yeah. you know, it was too late for that, and you know, obviously Ron Glass passed away, and and Adam yeah. Baldwin is problematic as fuck, so. <laughs> I was thinking, <clears throat> maybe do it animated. Bring them back to do the voices. You can recast Buck and, and Jane. But even then, it's too late. Like, Tudyk's price tag mm -hmm. probably has gone up. You yeah, know? quite a bit. Yeah, he was, his went up pretty quickly. Um, but, like, who else can play Buck other than Ron Glass? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that that is... That's exactly right. I couldn't see anybody replacing Ron Glass. Yeah. I mean, it's just no. And again, it's it's a rumor, so hopefully it stays that way. Yeah. Now, the one that's actually happening, and then I've had a bit of a change of heart on it, heart about as the day <laughs> has progressed. Sorry about that. Um, heart on is what I meant to say there. Um, oh, right, right. <laughs> um, now, this is happening. NBC is working on a sequel to Night Court. If you listen to us at all, you know that we are absolutely obsessed with Night Court. Um it's going to start. It's pro being produced by Melissa Rauch, Annette Rauch, and her husband. I can't think of his name offhand. Um, she's going to star as Abby Stone, the daughter of Harry T. Stone. Um, John Larroquette's coming back as Dan Fielding. It's being no written. No way, really? Mm -hmm. And it's being written at, by Dan Rubin, writer for Kimmy Schmidt. I liked Kimmy Schmidt. Although I liked I the first if... season. I never got around to the second one. Any of the others. You know, I don't know if I ever saw the last season. I can't remember if I did or not. <laughs> when I first saw the story this afternoon, I was dead set against it because nothing, very few things, if it, no actual things are sacred to me. Some abstract concepts, but no nouns are sacred to me. <laughs> Night Court comes damn close to being sacred to me. Um, so I don't think it can be touched. But if they don't try to redo the original, it could work. Yeah, as a sequel... That that's fine. Um, Change the character. I like her. Yeah. I I mean she's um she was good in in Big Bang Theory. But she's Bernadette in Big Bang Theory. For those who don't know the name. Yeah, I don't mm. see her as you know Harold T. Stone though. I'm you know. Curious if she's not trying to be Harry Anderson, and if we see Dan evolve because we haven't seen him in twenty something years. <laughs> if he's not the and same guy. <laughs> And talk about the comment section. Somebody was saying they couldn't do a character like Dan Fielding in this Me Too PC environment. It's like, dude, that was the point of the character. Yeah, but it, I don't know if, he, if even, well, if he is still the same guy, that's just kind of sad 25 years later, 20 something years later. Yeah. But Very also, true. Dan was an asshole in the 80s and 90s, but he was sympathetic. He wasn't the hero, though. Yeah, uh, and and well, no. he was, you know, he was a B, he's the original Me Too guy, almost. Right, I mean, right. Second to Daphne yeah. Coleman, of course. Right. <laughs> I don't know if, if that character, I think he's too much of a dinosaur now to even be yeah. at all sympathetic. But if, Well, right, right, he could be. He'd have to have gone through some change and, now, I guess. Yeah. Or just he, be in trouble constantly. <laughs> What could be interesting is they flip it on flip it on its head. Abby is super by the book. Dan has had an enlightenment thanks to his involvement with Harry. Comes back and kind of mentors her. Hmm. And then I guess it would be all about his sordid past, kind of. Yeah, thing. and then that would come up a lot of course. That down. Yeah, that could. Yeah, <laughs> um, I did a you little. Remember, they actually started out. He was in, supposed to be the straight man no, no, when, yeah. if you watch those early episodes, right. where he's very, you know, Mr. Moral Majority kind mm -hmm. of thing. Very and conservative. Then they decided early. to let him run. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, <laughs> Which well, I'm sure was so much more fun for Larry Cat. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I, I've, I did some checking. Um, the only cast members who are no longer with us are, of course, Harry Anderson, um, Salma Florence, and Paula yeah. Kelly, who played Liz in the first season. Everyone else is still alive, so I'm hoping they have lots of cameos. Really? Liz is no longer with us? Mm. Wow. Um, so, it, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm first, curious. It, if they were to do like a reboot, mm-hmm. I'd suggest in that con- when we were chatting online, I suggested NPH, but then I realized he's too old. Yeah, yeah. now Harry's got to be I young. Think, the whole gag with Harry is he's the youngest judge. judge in New York. Yeah. So actually, because my he pick, was home. If we, were, if we were talking reboot and we were talking setting this in the mm-hmm. present, my choice would be Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Because he would be the kind of guy yeah, yeah. that you would look at and go, wait, you're a judge? Right. Uh, the other problem with doing Night Court now is, if you were doing it the same way that they were doing it in the past, is that nerds and geeks are so much more common. Right. And back then, it was so weird that Harry Anderson was right. yeah. doing magic tricks and listening to Mel Torme and mm-hmm. whatever. Right. Oh, who? Now that would just be like, oh, whatever. That's that's your thing. Yeah. You do you. And uh, that's the thing with Night Court is if they go for that humor, there was so much randomness and so much like, fuck it, let's try it on that yeah. show. <laughs> I I don't know if they have the balls to do that these days. Ah, uh, you know, they. I think they've been doing it with Brooklyn Nine Nine. That's fair. That's fair. Like the whole Mel Torme angle. Was because the producer or one of the one of the staffers was related to Mel Torme and could book him, <laughs> could really? you know get him on the show. Tracy Torme, I don't remember what he did on the show. One of the producers, I think, was the nephew or son of of Mel Torme. So he's like, you know, they were like, yeah, I can get my own, you know, Mel Torme to be on the show. So they. I mean, it took him a few angle. seasons to have done that, you know. But they worked like, in I that angle. I don't remember that. him being on very early. Mm, I don't remember when he came in, but when he started doing guest appearances. But yeah, they worked in that whole angle because one of the producers, I'll say, was related to Mel Torme and could get him mm. on the show. In- interesting fun fact. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of uh, memes online saying that like Bull has to come back, Richard Shannon. Of course. Good God, yeah. Yeah. Like, he's the one that you really need to bring back. You know, the others, you know, it'd be nice to see them have cameos. But you need Bull. Okay, finally, um, before we get to this week's movie, on to our worst and best list of 2020, because this is our last show of the year. We have to do this. Yep. Starting with our worst lists, as always. Num- uh, this is this is only a bottom five because if I know in my case if I tried to go to ten I'd be like putting threes on here and I don't want to do that. <laughs> it was a good year. Number five, Lady Hawk. Uh, yeah, that was um, that was all right to me. It didn't make my bottom list. Um, what, yeah, what's your number five? <laughs> I I I actually had like a a three way tie, but. Uh-huh. I'll just give an honorable mention is Labyrinth, kind of my sixth spot. Uh-huh. But five for me would be 2020 Texas Gladiators. Oh, five. That's surprising it got so low. Um, <laughs> number four, this one we disagreed on, The Velocipaster. Yeah, that's uh, that's in my other okay, list. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> it went the other list. way this year. Um, normally there's one in my best list that's in your worst list. It flipped around this year. Uh, fourth worst movie, Flesh for Frankenstein. Okay. <laughs> you now, were spared it, uh-huh. but you, it sounds like you got the worst end of the deal. Yeah, yeah. Like, just wait <laughs> As we'll more. talk soon. Um, yeah. Number three, I have 2020 Texas Gladiators. Uh, for my third, uh, and I almost, I forget most of the details of this. I just remember being really uh-huh. bored. It is a Titan AE. Uh-huh. That almost made it. I think for some reason I gave it a three. That and FX, I remember remember being dreadful, but we gave them double threes. I gave it a three. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, a stranger in the Alps. Yeah. At number two, I have Ninja Cheerleaders. Uh, my two is Lust for Freedom. Okay. 
And, of course, my worst of the year, Blood for Dracula. Probably the worst I've seen on the show. My worst is Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet. Okay. It's, you know, what's up, Tiger Lily, without the uh, the humor? Mm. Surprising Ninja <laughs> Cheerleaders didn't make it. Um, no, no. I, know, I hated that worse more than you did. Um, Takei kept it out, actually. Uh-huh. Takei bought it half a brain, and it actually kept it off uh-huh. the bottom list. Right. Uh, it was really uh, tight. These were twos and ones, pretty much. Okay. I think, yeah, I only had one zero. Uh, was uh, Blood Drip for Dracula was a zero. Ninja Cheerleaders was a one. Yeah. Everything else was like a two. Um, on to our best list. Uh, yes. At number 10, I have this week's movie, Santa Jaws. <laughs> It, it just edged out, Land. Um, actually, which edged out a movie I expected to be in your bottom list, um, Heavy Metal. Uh, uh, no, no, it... Uh, didn't quite make it. No. Um, at no, number I'm nine... Trying no. I'm trying to remember why. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, do you want to just do your list? Yeah, no, no what do you have at ten, sorry. Uh, from Beyond. You know what, at first when I saw the title, I was like, what uh, what was that again? And uh, and then I wrote, oh, Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> <laughs> that so. didn't quite make it for me. Um, but I had like, what's? I think we had six double fives. My top nine are all fives. I had to go oh, to wow. one four and a half. Um, this was a real tough choice. Ten show. for me. Mm-hmm. Ten for me was a really tough choice because I had a lot. The, these are all fours. Mm-hmm. So it, it contended with Reign of Fire, Velocipaster, uh-huh. Monty Python, The Meaning of Life, Outland, Life Force, and then Pale Cocoon. Right. Wow. In that order, pretty much. Like, Pale Cocoon would be by 11. Yeah. Reign of Fire would be by 16. At number nine, I have Life Force. Yeah, it almost made it to my top. Mm-hmm. Uh, nine, I have Sister Tempest. At eight, I have Sinister Tempest. <laughs> my eight is Hairspray. Okay. Uh, my uh, my seven is uh, Harold and Maude. Yeah, we're, we're into all my fives now. Mm-hmm. Seven is uh, How to Grow a Band. Okay, well, I thought we had six. Oh, you had an extra five than I did. Okay. We had six doubles. Now we're into the doubles. Um, at number six, I have Here There Be Monsters. Same here. Oh, wow. Uh, at at number- five, I have... Number well, five, I have had a grow band. But oh, okay. What's yours? What's your mine's had a grow band? What's your five? Uh, what we left behind, uh, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. That's my number four. And uh, oh, what was your five? Uh, five is had a grow band. Four is what we left uh, behind. My four is Padma Inverted. Okay. My three is Karis Hell. Same here. Oh, I expected that to be one for you. I'm. I'm <laughs> Interested though. Um, two, uh, two, two. I have two. I have hairspray. Two. I have Harold and Maud. Okay, and my number one, of course, I'm the anime geek. It's Paramount Inverted. And uh, my number one, one you did not like all that much, but mm-hmm. best in show. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And now, finally, on to this week's movie, which is from 2018, Santa Jaws. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary. Sponsored by Cursed Objects. Always read the warning label first. And also brought to you by Big Easy Easy Comics. I don't know why I can't say Big Easy. (laughs) (laughs) Big Easy Comics. Come for the bad jokes. Stay for the arsenal. All right. So we have uh, a child or kid. I don't know. He's a high school student, I suppose. Teenager. Uh, misunderstood he's one of those you know comic book geeks that uh you know you hardly see any of these days and uh he uh but he's also a comic book artist and he has uh drawn a uh, a santa a killer shark santa claus um comic book and uh well he's of course misunderstood and um grounded and uh, but he gets a magic pen for Christmas, or is it a cursed pen? Well, I don't know. I think it was a mad. It was kind of an enchanted pen. An enchanted pen. And, yeah, it's not necessarily cursed. It depends on what you draw. Yes, 
And so he went and drew his shark while he was angry. And um, it's, you know, that shark is, of course, then finally brought to life and uh, begins to terrorize, well, mostly his family. But, it, I mean, it would terrorize the town, too, because <laughs> they, they're they all on the lake. Right. And so, uh, first, nobody believes him. Uh, they don't bother checking to find that Pop-Pop is dead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, he uh, he eventually assembles a uh, group together to uh, help him fight the shark. And uh, the family, of course, you know, the ones that don't get picked off, <laughs> they, uh, they discover that you need to use Christmas objects to attract and harm the shark. And um, so they, they have a confrontation with it. It, of course, gets the best of them here and there. And then he, um, well, he comes up with a uh, The Christmas a way... weapons hurt it, but don't quite finish the job. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. The, the shark... But he realizes, of course, he's had the weapon with him all the time that he could use against it. And that is, of course, the, uh, the enchanted pen. No, it was Which, the Zippo that his uncle left him the early... Actually, just kind of left on the table early in the movie. Oh, yeah. He burnt the paper that he drew it on, and that lit the shark on fire. And then hilarity ensues. Hmm. And it opens with this like clip from a movie, almost, about a, a serial killer dressed as Santa. That was a nice surprise. The opening itself was very clever. The ornaments yeah, yeah. look a lot like fishing bobbers. True, true. You know, the, the, the ornaments that are just kind of floating in the water. Mm-hmm. And actually, it wasn't a movie within a movie. It was an actual scene where this, this killer was dressed as Santa. He falls off the dock, gets eaten by um, a shark wearing a Santa hat. That, the shark, yeah, the hat somehow finds its way to the fin. Yeah. It, it stays on even underwater. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm there, looking at my notes. It was part, that was a scene from the comic book. Yes. That that was that the, or, was the that comic in the comic book. book that was the origin of Santa Claus, Santa Shark, or Santa. And Jones. the lines are just so deliciously bad. Um, mm-hmm. Better watch out. You better not die. It yeah. doesn't even make any sense, but it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, but my favorite, of course, see you in Jingle Hell. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I actually want to see that movie. Um, also, the act. We, and then we, of course, we meet his family. Um, his his grandfather looks like Santa Claus. He's that type. Um, yeah, he's got this uncle who looks remarkably like Michael McKean. Oh yeah, yeah, he does. Um, by the way, rest in peace, David Olander. He was mostly a TV guy, so we won't be doing a tribute. But just wanted to mention that oh. since I just thought of Michael McKean. Um, Squiggy from Liver and Squirrely. Squ- uh, yeah. Squirrely yeah. passed away. Um, also, um, Cody, the kid who played Cody, Reed Miller, c- creepily amused, amusingly creepy, I'll call him. <laughs> He's another He's... one like Christian Slater and Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who is like that Nicholson type. He's been at this for a few years now. I mm. mean, he has like a ton of credits on, right. like 33 credits on his IMDb yeah. already and he's like I think he I mean he's older than the kid in the movie but I, I still think he's under 20 um, yeah very impressive now I know it's a horror movie and this is the kind of shit that happens but he opens the pen it's inscribed in German why wouldn't you translate it <laughs> you have that. Google it's set in the modern day you can just Google it translate that shit <laughs> I forgot which character it was. It might be written in Elvin or something. <laughs> Probably the comic book owner. Like, um, no, it's it's German. <laughs> the the guy who ran the comic book shop, um, I don't remember the actor's name, but looks remarkably like Jeff Jeff McPherson, who played Doctor Tiki on Tiki Bar TV. So that was interesting. Um, <laughs> also, they went out fishing in like a hoodie and a vest on Christmas Eve. I want to live in that weather. That's Louisiana. Yeah, I, I figured Big Easy Comics. It was set in Louisiana, but yeah, yeah. I I want no winter. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, but then you're cursed with 
he, he lots of other issues summer. living down there yeah well i can deal with the heat it's more oh like, it's it's not the heat it's, it's the, the humidity, humidity. yeah <laughs> Good God, to just open your door up and you feel like you you could just you have to swim out because <laughs> it just feels like you're entering another planet. I've decided. I decided, you know, ages ago. I, I want to live somewhere where it's perpetually warm, but that there aren't any giant bugs or natural disasters, Regu- <laughs> regularly occurring natural disasters. I, I can't. I haven't found that place yet. Um, back to the movie. Loves yes. how abruptly Santa Jaws attacked the grandfather. Oh yeah, I love how all the attacks are just complete Monty Python. Yeah. Just <laughs> someone in the comments on IMDb criticized the movie because they said it took itself too seriously. This isn't one of those super jokey kind of movies like Carousel, but it right. definitely knows what it is. Yeah, they're just a little more subtle about it. I mean, we get the first death within twenty minutes. It doesn't fuck around. And the person who gave him the pen is the first victim. Uh, I mean, yeah, and I thought I was going to be sad because his grandpa was like his one ally. Mm. But just the appearance of the shark was yeah. hilarious. Right. <laughs> it like completely doesn't make you feel bad that his, he just lost his grandfather, which is terrible. Right. But just the way this whole... Like the 16 ton weight effect for Body Python, where it's all kind of sped up, right? Gods must be crazy style, mm-hmm. and of course, the glowing red eyes of the shark, yeah. too, which you're not expecting. It's just completely ridiculous, and it kind of takes away the, the emotional impact of the moment in one sense, right, right. but it makes it so much funnier. I mean, it's like what Dr. Evil's describing <laughs> the sharks with lasers, yeah, yeah, exactly. Shark with a freaking Santa hat. Um, yeah. Although, sure, just after that scene, when Cody runs home and tells his parents that, and, and uncle, aunt and uncle that, that it's, their gran- his grandfather was killed, he seemed a bit too calm. Like, he was ranting about, like, Santa Shark is alive and we need to kill it, but he didn't seem that broken up about his grandfather. <laughs> right. It's kind of, yeah, he, he gets broken up when one of his friends dies and the... I think his brother, and mm. then like the girl next everybody door. Everybody but... dies except him. True, it, it kills everybody. Um, loved his rant about how his family doesn't believe him either. You know, I liked. I think that's why the movie worked for me. I just really liked Reed Miller in that role. Oh yeah, he's he good. was perfect. Um, and I loved the way he played off of I don't I don't have the, the character's name but his his co author of the comic book the kid who wrote the book they played off other off of each other really well. Um, and, and there's one thing though there's no way they don't they wouldn't rope that kid into working in the restaurant like uh-huh, of course grounding is not a punishment mm-hmm. if the alternative is you have to go work at the family business right especially you're on fucking Christmas working Eve. in the family business <laughs> yeah. And then you're coming home and not doing anything. Yeah. It's Christmas Eve. Is his relatives own a restaurant? Is, is his right. parents own a restaurant? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's working there on Christmas. <laughs> um, loved the. Uh, uh, you can probably hear the air quotes when I say this yacht. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but his uncle Mikey, who was basically like a Dan Fielding type, we were just talking about night court, um, gets a, a yacht. It's a cabin cruiser. It's a, it's a fishing trawler, really. Um, yeah. And they kind of reference that later. Um, his wife is this Instagram model who was incredibly vapid. Um, played the I role brilliantly. I could come up with a good sponsor for it. It was um, Snapstagram, and I mm-hmm. couldn't come yeah, up yeah. with a good, <laughs> as good a well, tagline for that. It's hard to mock the real thing. Uh, it mocks itself yeah. enough. Um, but I loved, really liked seeing him getting, eat, getting eaten and Harold getting eaten later. Um <laughs> <laughs> hated both of them, but I hated them in a way that I really liked. You know, it's not just like they were irritating me. They they were fun, bad characters. Right, because the uncle was kind of, you know, mm. on his side. You know, the grandfather. You didn't get him I, necessarily. You like, you like the grandfather. Um, the uncle was kind of on his side, yeah. Right. Kind of believed him. Gave him, you know, the secret weapon and then got eaten. He was kind of like in, did his thing and he was out. It was nicely done. He, although he did get eaten off camera, that was a bit of an uh, that I didn't care for. 
But there was a fake out because she thought the wife was going to get it first. Yeah. Because she's in, like, you know, floating around, mm-hmm. you know, in the water. Right. But then he gets eaten off camera. Um, they really didn't have much of a gore budget, unfortunately. Oh, it was this incredible CGI they were using. Yeah. Um, but I, I did. I don't know if you could hear the air quotes uh-huh. when I said incredible. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, it's really funny CGI. Right. Yeah. It's deliberately bad and hilarious. Um, they like did the build the self. <laughs> they did build tension nicely before they were written. Um, and I just loved that they just leaned into the fake CG. Like Santa Jaws didn't look at all real. No. Um, also, well, uh, you know, Cody ropes in this local girl who has a crush on to help him kill the. Well, no, she she gets the comic right. She, the the comic book store owner gave her the comic because she, he thought she might be into it. The comic that Cody and his friend wrote. Um, he gets he retrieves it from her to, to kind of, you know, uh, to try to figure out what to do. And she said she said she left it what, at the school or something. She left it somewhere. It was left in uh, one of the boats because she had to stick okay, in right. the water. Okay, right. We're recording on a Wednesday night. I, I did my review last Saturday, so parts have left my brain. Um <laughs> She said, it's only a 12-minute jog away. I loved... And she's like an athlete, track and field athlete. I loved right. his expression. Because he's this, like, nerdy kid. She's saying, it's a 12-minute jog. <laughs> <laughs> Reed Miller... I know... I, the, where I want to see Reed Miller is a, is a Wes Anderson movie. The kid is made for a oh, Wes yeah. Anderson movie. Yeah, um, I can see that. We did, oh, we she, did get a little more... The girl next door had one of my favorite lines in the whole movie, of course. Mm. And uh, that was, well, if we just stay away from the water, we'll be just fine. (laughs) (laughs) And I love the, there's a, it's very brief, but I could swear there was like a look of horror on everybody's face in the room. (laughs) Because it's like, oh my God, the whole movie's kind of like lost. (laughs) And then they have to like talk back like no we gotta go and fight this thing <laughs> that moment remind me of some of the parts of um um thanks killing where they kind of acknowledge it's a movie right yeah um we did finally get to see some gore with um the the elf i think you called him um yes guy in a santa suit you know gets his legs cut off by a boat that santa jaws pushes at him and then he's just spurting fake very obvious fake blood um, and and the big big easy comics the comic book shop he goes to, it's kind of a reverse TARDIS. It looks way bigger on the outside. <laughs> it's like one aisle on the inside, but it's this like well, big like two duplex store on the outside. There's a whole arsenal, you know, that they have to store in there and uh, tons mm-hmm. of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, my favorite line was the Insta model is uh, Mikey's wife. Uh, Uncle Mike wasn't afraid. Of, or, or no, it was. I'm sorry, it was uh, one of his nephews. Um, Uncle Mike wasn't afraid of anything except clowns. <laughs> um, I don't think I remember her saying. That. Yeah, some I forget. <laughs> I uh, that. He referred to it as Uncle Mikey. So I'm um, Uncle Mike. So I'm assuming it wasn't. No, I, I, I like I said, it was days ago. But I, I, I liked the just tagged on except clowns. <laughs> <laughs> now, the whole nerd versus jock thing, mm-hmm. I thought was just what the fuck was that even in there for? I don't even understand what it was doing in there. Well, the brother, who is an athlete, a baseball player, has this whole monologue about, you know, um, oh, what is, there it is, um, and that, an analogy about in life, uh, about how baseball is like life and all of this. Um, and I just couldn't help thinking again, thanks killing, in that how in life you can't, call, you, you can't just call an audible. <laughs> it just reminded me of that, that scene. Um, yeah, they didn't really play the nerd versus jock thing too much, but they did kind of mess play with the idea that the brother was this star athlete. Um, yeah, because they had to, they ended up using melee weapons against a shark, which was hilarious. <laughs> you know, swords and shit and shit against a uh, fucking shark. Candy cane impalement. Mm. Also, creative use of weaponry. 
uh, or of a of a tool by the shark, Christmas lights to pull the Insta model into the into the water to eat her. Oh right, I mean, I, I, come on, he uses the boat to crush that elf's yeah. legs. Right. <laughs> it was a dude dressed as an elf. It wasn't a real elf, of course. If you're anyone wondering. Yeah. Um. Also loved the exploding ornaments. They had to pa- they had basically <laughs> had to Christmasize a bunch of weapons to get them to affect Santa Joss. And and you know, they wrapped um, you know, lights around a spear and, and one of them was a were these ornaments packed with explosive. I thought uh, replacing the Jaws theme with jingling bells was brilliant as yeah, well. Yeah. Um I also liked when Cody's father decided to be reasonable and not just charge toward Santa Jaws. He was, he, you know, he didn't ask to be killed. He was one of the few people in the movie who didn't ask to be killed. He was still killed, <laughs> but... Um, Steve, the, Steve was his name, the co-author. Um, his death was a little telegraphed, but I still liked it. He went to throw uh, an explosive at, at um, Santa Jaws, one of the ornaments... It missed. He missed it. Landed on the ed- edge of the pier. He goes to grab it, and Santa Jaws comes up beneath him. It's also in the trailer. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Um, I loved Cody's father at the comic book shop asking Clark, the comic book guy, "What is wrong with you?" <laughs> well, you do kind of wonder that because he is kind of a, just this asshole throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I. I I really wanted to see Clark get eaten. Fortunately, they all got eaten. Um, so I got to see that. Um, loved the scene after he... They leave, They drop the pen in the comic book store. So Clark yeah. has access to this pen that basically it makes whatever you draw. Like, whatever you draw with it becomes real. Um, so they come back to get the pen after he lies to them initially, saying he doesn't have it. Um, they, you know, there's suddenly this woman there and, you know, he's got, there's this, you know, beautiful car outside and he, he ducks out to go get the pen or he tells them I'll go get the pen and behind them in a window, you see him going to the nice car. And that's when you see that that's when they see all this stack of money (laughs) of this, like, he's not coming back. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, they chase him down. The the problem, of course, is if I were to ever come across something like that, I'm a terrible drawer. So everything yeah, I had I can't draw would look like shit. Right. Yeah. Anything I would really want, I can't draw. Um, but you know, he he goes off to the pier to to run away with you know with the pen, leaves the money in the woman, um, and obviously he'd have to leave the boat. Um, but. I love that they chased him down with their bikes. He's in a sports car. They're chasing him (laughs) on bikes. Then, of course, the girl next door gets killed because it had. They have to have you know death of the mentor. Yeah. Yeah. They they need to motivate Cody. Um, She's the only victim I didn't want to see die, aside from the grandfather. I thought it would be funnier if she couldn't swim. Yeah. Talking yeah. about you know being a triathlete right, or whatever, right. <laughs> but, but you know she's you know, everything up until that point is about running, mm-hmm. and then like I'm thinking of being a triathlete, and then you know, it turns out she couldn't swim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, she could, of course, mm-hmm. just not fast enough. Um, also loved um, when the you know he draws in the spear that impaled Santa Jaws. <laughs> it just <laughs> yes. appears and it becomes. Uh, like a horn. <laughs> now he's got a horn. <laughs> the pen not finishing him off was a nice swerve. Um, loved Cody's father blaming Santa Jaws on global warming. <laughs> and well, I mean, they have so many creatures. I'm sure in that uh, lake, it's Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> would, be would be that crazy for a shark to. Uh... And when it eats Cody's mother, it chomps on her, but it doesn't kill her. Like, she has, like, five lines. She has a bunch of lines while it's chomping on her. Yeah. Um, That's the kind of... That's how I knew this movie. They knew what they had, because they throw in shit like that. Um, (laughs) Now, 
I'm here's the part I'm curious about because they fake the it was only a dream ending. Yeah, this is where they lose me. <laughs> but it wasn't. The bulk of it happened <sighs> on new on Christmas Eve, right? Yeah. He wakes up on Christmas Day. Later we find he still has the pen. So it all happened. But you know, it's still I mean you kinda you kind of They saw and that they were going to do this. They bring every everybody is still alive when he wakes up. Right. It's a Christmas movie. There has to be the Christmas miracle. <laughs> That's the Christmas miracle. There has to be one in every Christmas movie. And they do the whole, you know, Scrooge thing of, oh, I'll be a better person now kind of thing. Yeah. But then he doesn't really. But, I mean, he, he sees that he's going to at least try. Mm -hmm. I also like that he burnt the, paint, the the drawing of Santa Jaws but kept the pen. He got well, rid of yeah. the harmless thing but kept the cursed object. <laughs> And of course, that's the I Smell sequel moment. <laughs> exactly. Also, they didn't crowbar in a romantic subplot between Cody and, and uh, Jetna. But he, they well, just kind the of... romantic subplot was there from the beginning. Well, he was interested in her. But they didn't, yeah. like, hook up under the duress of the whole thing. He just, you know, because he had the experience of the next day that nobody else had, he had the guts to, like, ask her out, which was nice. Um, and he, yeah, he knew more about her and right. was able to. Yeah. But it, it didn't feel crowbarred in like romantic, so many romantic subplots are. Um, right. It, it was, it was literally the point though, you know, it was, mm -hmm. he was into her from the beginning yeah. and. Uh, it was you baked know, in, which, you know, it wasn't. The oper right. Yeah. It wasn't just there to check a box. So I was, I appreciated that. <laughs> That's, those are the romantic subplots that pissed me off are the ones that are just there to check a box. The ones that are just like, wait, what? Yeah. Two of them suddenly okay, and they found time to do right. this? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> On a sequels and remakes? On a sequels and remakes. I kind of want to see a sequel because I want to see what kind of idiotically, foolishly idiotic, dangerous thing he draws next. <laughs> you know, where can they go with this idea? Uh, yeah, a budget would have been cool because, I mean,. Think of how awesome it would have been if Clark couldn't have draw, draw, drawn well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there were just some mangled things. Right, right. <laughs> in the store. More money for more draw. gore and, and, you know, badly drawn stuff would be good. Um, you know, his supermodel girlfriend was a badly drawn supermodel. Right, right. <laughs> would have been really funny. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Nothing's wrong. On the brains. On the brains. I really enjoyed it. Like I said earlier, it's a four and a half. I enjoyed it all the way through except the end. Um, Technically not a so, dream. <laughs> so, so I'm going three and a half. All right. And what have we learned? Uh, we learned that, uh, yeah, well, nothing nothing ruins a movie like the only a dream ending or even if you shoot her in a, or is it? <laughs> And I learned that the pen really is mightier, mightier than the sword, though not oh, quite nice. as powerful as a magic Zippo. <laughs> that's it for Santa Jones, and thankfully that's it for 2020. Until next year, when we'll be reviewing House, kicking off our reviews of the House trilogy. We have wanted to do this for years. Mm -hmm. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. There you are.